My name is Todd Savitt. <clears throat> I teach up in the Department of Bioethics at the med school. And I have a, a formal presentation that Melissa handed me, so I have to read this to make sure I cover everything. And then I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, so this is the second presentation of this fall series. And we are sponsored by the Lawpus Library History Collections and uh, my Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies. As Melissa already said, please sign in there and grab refreshments in the back. If you're attending as part of the ECU Wellness Passport Program, please see Lane Carpenter uh, after the program and you'll get stamped. Okay. So upcoming presentations. Monday, the 22nd of October, will be a topic of Influenza 1918, the North Carolina experience with Dan Shingleton, who is there in the back, uh, from the Division of Public Health. Uh, and on Monday, November 12th, Department of, it's not Division anymore, it's School of Public Health, yeah. Uh, Monday, the 12th of November, Mariner's Maladies, examining medical equipage from Queen Anne's Revenge shipwreck. Dr. Linda Carnes McNaughton uh, from Fort, Gra Fort Bragg, archeologist. And we have an exhibit here uh, on the second floor called Anatomy of the Book, Then and Now, in the History Collections room, which is down the hall there, an exhibit on the Country Doctor Museum and all around us are other exhibits on this floor. There's a pop-up exhibit, Paleopathology, Rewriting the History of Plagues and Diseases with Modern Molecular DNA Methods, that sounds familiar, uh, to complement this presentation. And uh, another pop-up exhibit, The Spanish Influence is here, Memories of the 1918 Influence Epidemic in Eastern North Carolina. And finally, uh, right over there on those cases, the scientists and their microscopes exhibit. So today's presenter is Richard Baltaro, uh, MD, PhD, professor of pathology and laboratory medicine here at the Brody School of Medicine. Dr. Baltaro earned his bachelor's degree at Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, and then his doctorate in microbiology from the University of Rome in Italy, and his MD from Catholic University in Rome, um, and then did a residency at Brown School of Medicine. Uh, finally, he did fellowship work at George Washington University and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, related to the topic that he's speaking on today, uh, he has been since 1995 a member of two international organizations, the Paleopathology Club and the History of Pathology Society, and I'm sure if you asked him, he would tell you about those. Uh, the title of his talk is up there, and I won't repeat it, so I'll just turn it over to Dr. Baltaro. Thank you. Does he still need this? I, no. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right, I have a, all right, so if you go to the, CDC website, the Center for Disease Control, uh, and you look on plague, you will pick up this page. And one of the things you will see is uh, one of the classic uh, uh, dresses the physicians used to wear in the 1700s. Uh, this is Dr. Beek or Dr. Schnabel, uh, which is the German name. And uh, the CDC starts, the page says, you know, Maybe the Roman Empire, they had an epidemic of plague around 165, but there are three major epidemics that I will uh, discuss. And this is something that we did not know uh, more than 20 years ago, because what we have been able to do, we've been able to do DNA tests on uh, remnants of people that died during these epidemics. And so we can actually have positive identification, and I will discuss one technique in particular on it. So there was this uh, uh, collapse of Rome, which may or may not have been caused a plague. It's called the Antonine Plague. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that it, uh, Emperor Marcus Aurelius uh, 
died of it, and he was the last great emperor in 180 AD. And in Europe, we now have the longest peacetime in Europe since his death. So there has been no major war in Europe since 1945. So to me, they are connected that way. It also, my apartment in Rome was built on top of his uh, 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 place where he used to live. But there was a Justinian plague uh, around the 5th and 6th and 7th century uh, AD. And of course, everybody talks about the Black Plague, which started in China, but, uh, and it spread along the trade routes, and it killed possibly as many as 60% of the European population. And by the way, Justinian Plague did about the same. Uh, now, we did have a third epidemic of plague, which started in China again around 1850s, and uh, it was also present in San Francisco and Hawaii at the turn of the century. So this is our friend, Dr. Schnabel, and I almost considered getting myself one of these Halloween costumes <laughs> and, and come dressed like that, but uh, okay. So the, the Black Death, or the Black Plague, is uh, the worst catastrophe in Europe as far as the number of people killed. So imagine the population of the United States of 300 and some million people, 100 or 200 million people died in a couple of years. This is something we haven't seen since, and, and we've had epidemics afterwards. Eventually, it died out in most places. However, it became zoonotic, epizoonotic, which is, by the way, is also present in the western part of the United States in the animals. And plagues recurred uh, frequently. In fact, I, um, I, I made a partial list of some of the major ones until around the uh, 19th century. So as I said, nobody's quite sure exactly how many people died, but the number of people died was humongous. So this is a Boccaccio, happened to be a famous Italian uh, writer of the 12th century, and he said, how many valiant men, how many fair ladies breakfast with their kinfolk and the same night supped with their ancestors in the next world. So one of the uh, ways you can die is you have the pneumonic plague. You breathe it in, it goes into your bloodstreams, and you die very quickly. This is one of the maps I will show. And uh, as far as Europe is concerned, uh, Fedorosia or Kaffa, there was a battle there, and then they catapulted uh, the people with plague out of the city, and of course the intelligence decided to go check them out, see what information they could get, and uh, they brought their, uh, the epidemic to Istanbul, then they passed, by the way, Greece, they went to Messina, and then they went to Venice, Genoa and Venice. And then, of course, from then it spread all over the place. So here is the spread in Italy. Messina is here. And uh, it would usually come in by ship. And then people would land, go on the land and spread it. And notice how Genoa and Venice were the place. Once uh, they started figuring things out, and they didn't figure it out very quickly, but at first, the grave workers were so overwhelmed that bodies are tossed from carts into hastily dug pits, and they were covered with a thin layer of dirt, and uh, sometimes animals might uh, pick up the body, you know, they might dig up and pick up the bodies. Uh, so here I made a list of a number of epidemics. The first one, uh, the number of people that died in that uh, 1347 to 51 was in the millions. But then you can see, we generally had thousands of them. Uh, and you would have different places, like uh, one that I will mention specifically is the London Plague. And by then, it looked like it was not as serious as there were before. And notice uh, there were riots in Moscow about the time of the American Revolution, uh, when they had an epidemic. And uh, as late as 1891 in Egypt, 300,000 people died. And a little more than 100 years ago, they had the plague in Baghdad, which is 
still part probably of this second epidemic. So there was a great plague in London. And um, this was uh, from a BBC, I read the BBC, so as you can see, this is uh, a little over two years ago in 2016. And they showed, uh, there is a little film you can pick up and see this individual. They actually figured out that he was one of the people that died of the plague. And I will show you the technique. Incidentally, the second epidemic probably started in China around 1320s. And then it went to this place here, which is in Kyrgyzstan, in Central Asia, is Lake Isikul. And from there it stayed a, a while. And then from there it spread uh, west. And uh, about uh, the same time or shortly after that it presented in Europe, it also presented in Mecca. And then it had already been infectious in India for quite some time. Now, the third pandemic uh, also started in China, and it started in the south, one of the southern provinces, which is Yunnan, and eventually it affected all continents, and in Hong Kong, it killed 90% of the population. So everything in Hong Kong is since, practically, that time. Uh, and most of the deaths occurred in India and China. By the time of the turn of the century, 1890s, we had petri dishes, we had microbiology labs, uh, we were able to uh, identify the organism, and the organism was uh, named Yershinia pestis for Dr. Yershin, who identified it. It arrived in the Hawaii in 1899, and it arrived in San Francisco in 1900. Now, the epidemic in San Francisco was centered around uh, Chinatown, and it was the first uh, plague epidemic in the United States. The epidemic was recognized uh, in the year 1900, but of course, the, uh, for two years, the governor denied it and hid it, et cetera, fake news, et cetera. So uh, another governor took place. By the way, the second governor, George Pardee, was a medical doctor. So he quietly implemented a medical solution. He let the scientists go through, and of course, uh, the epidemic was ended. According to the World Health Organization, the third pandemic was active until 1959. And at that time, they only had 200 cases a year worldwide. So if you want to hear read about plague, fears, and politics in San Francisco, Chinatown, there is a book for you. Of course, they had anti-Chinese uh, media. Now, one of the things that a plague does is it affects regional lymph nodes. And these are known as buboes. And because this was described in the Middle Ages in the Black Plague, it was believed that that disease in the Middle Ages was caused by this organism. So you, usually you, you get the, these bubas near the places where you may be bitten uh, frequently by uh, ticks or, or fleas, better fleas, rat fleas to be exact. And therefore the inguinal nodes are more frequent. But you can also see axillary nodes. And when the tissue dies, you have this darkening of the extremities, which is the reason why you call it black death. Okay. And uh, eventually, uh, if you don't do anything, well, no med medical treatment, about half the people will die with the bubonic plague. The pneumonic plague is almost 100% fatal if untreated. And as I said before, it is the disease, uh, because the governor in California didn't do much, it has established an epizoonotic disease in the western part of the states. So if you go out hiking in California, Arizona, Nevada, places like that, and you get bitten by fleas, you can get plague. Uh, by the way, Plague is also a potential bioterrorist uh, 
threat. Uh, you can weaponize the spores and make them about the same size, filter them, and uh, you can give uh, pneumonic plague. And it is present in many parts of the world. Uh, so here we have, uh, uh, as far as 1998, places where plague has been reported, the countries are in orange, and the major areas of activity are in red. So Yoshina pestis was and is considered the most likely agent for black plague. And uh, historically, a lot of the blame has been given to places, rats and fleas. Although it turns out that we now think that person-to-person -person, uh, communication through, through the mnemonic stage is also one way that the disease spreads. Uh, and of course, when you are going to do DNA tests, one of the problems with uh, molecular DNA tests is that you can have contamination from environmental sources. And you're now dealing with uh, sites that are hundreds of years old. So it's possible that you actually will amplify things that were not in, in the tissue, but they were on the tissue. So you have to be very careful to clean things. And another problem with uh, PCR, it tends to amplify a lot of things. So originally, we started getting a number of reports, DNA reports, of other organisms that were not implicated, not just with plague, but with other diseases. So uh, a technique had to be uh, developed that would be uh, without any false positives. Finally, in the year 2000, a team of French investigators published this paper in the Proceedings of National uh, uh, Archives of Science. And uh, what they showed was that you can actually prevent false positives, and they called their technique suicide PCR. Here are the authors of the study. And what they did is they went to the 800 grave in uh, Montpellier, which is in southern France. And they excavated this site. And as you know, when people are buried, very frequently we label who died, uh, what date they died, how many people died. So e even mass graves frequently, at least you put in the date on when people are. So, you, you go to a site where there are uh, bones, and one of the things you're particularly interested in is teeth, because teeth become sealed, and if there are any bacteria in, or viruses in there, theoretically you should be able to uh, reproduce them by PCR. So in this case, that particular paper, which was the first paper uh, on this series, is they had four teeth collected from a child's skull, and they had nine from a female skull and ten from a male skull. And as negative control, they took uninterrupted, uninterrupted teeth from ancient skeletons from a nearby uh, grave, which they knew that it wasn't involved in the plague. And you have to do this in a laboratory that has never done PCR for plague before. Everything has to be new. So A is a photograph of a tooth, then you do uh, x-rays of teeth, and what you do is you collect the pulp and the root of the teeth in there, and then you subject that to PCR. To avoid any possibility of molecular contamination, the DNA submitted to this quote-unquote suicide PCR amplification targeting uh, Yersinia pestis uh, targets that have never been previously uh, targeted in the laboratory. So there are, unlike many parts of science, we don't have any positive controls. So uh, the danger, the reason why it's suicidal, because if it doesn't work, you don't get anything out of it, right? But if it's positive, that is a good sign. So the suicide PCR permits primers pairs to be used only once. A multiple set of primers could be test unit and amplicon as expected size is yield. 
the amplicon then has to be confirmed, and then you can also sequence them. So here are the primers that were used. And uh, in this particular paper, they used five different primers. And some of them established the genus and the species, and some of them established uh, certain parts of the chromosome of the virus, of the bacterium or virus, but in this case, bacteria. So you can then identify it correctly. And so uh, then they did, the, first they did the child, and then they did the, the two adults, and then they did the reverse complement of the primers. And by the way, there was some talk that maybe the black plague may have been caused by rickettsia, proazeki, so they attempted to prove that, and none of the cases turned out to be positive for that. So the sequence derived 100% uh, Yersinia pestis PLA uh, sequence. And by the way, a mutation was noted at the end of the hydrophobic domain by, for the PCR for the adult teeth. They all had the same mutation, and this is typical. The, they have Yersinia, but they don't necessarily have the modern sequence that is available in most labs. And I will talk about this more later. So uh, you don't want to have any field contamination. You only have positive, you don't have any positive controls. And you have to have new targets design everything new. And the primers can only be used once. So uh, this is 100% uh, predictive for, uh, this paper was for uh, Yersinia. So it basically ended the controversy of what caused this epidemic. This was the 13th century, and so we are in the 20th century. This was the year 2000. So then they started looking for other things. One of the things that they found, well, well there was this uh, epidemic uh, around 1558, and it went on until 750, and uh, uh, at that time, uh, it was the Byzantine Empire, or the Roman Empire, and Justinian was emperor, and he was in the process of reunifying the empire. It, they had conquered all of Italy. It was in the process of uh, unifying uh, Hispania, which is uh, Spain, and Gallia, which is France. And then this, this thing broke out. He lost half of his soldiers. There was no money, and they had to call everything off. And had the history gone slightly different, uh, we may not be talking of Western Empire and Eastern Empire ending uh, in 476, but we may have t talked about ending it later, in 600 or 700. So in uh, 2014, that's four years ago, uh, this paper was published in, uh, in Lancet, and they went to the graves in places like Is Constantinople, which is nowadays Istanbul, and they found uh, enough teeth, and uh, this is the paper. And then again, the, the Yersinia that caused that was slightly different from the one uh, from the Black Plague, and of course it's not the same as the one today. So this is the, you see, uh, the, the emperor was Justinian, who, uh, for which is the, the plague is named after. And you see, he had conquered Italy. He was in the process of defeating the Visigoths in Spain and the Franks in France. So the empire would have been reunited under one emperor. Uh, in the city of Constantinople, uh, there were almost half the population died, 40%. And he went on for a while. This gentleman is Justinian. He got the Black Plague, but he survived. His wife, Theodora, uh, she died of it. It turns out that they used to import uh, food from Egypt, but the epidemic in this particular case started in Ethiopia, went from here, and you, you can read the historical text and you know when the disease came. Uh, by the way, after the Black Plague, they discovered that if you uh, halt a ship for 30 days, uh, you eliminate most of the problem. And so they used the Venetian word, Trentina, 
And then they found out that wasn't good enough. Then you want the quarantina. A quarantina is 40 days, so quarantine is the word that we use. You know that if no one gets sick for 40 days, you're home free. And that was one of the ways that you implemented. Now, if you review the various methods for subtitling in Yoshinia, uh, from the phenotypes of the whole genome sequence, what you find out is that um, uh, the, the types of uh, Yoshinia you find, they're related. And you can make a family tree and you can find out which mutation came first and which came second and how are they related uh, genetically. And which helps you explain this epidemic from that epidemic. So we now know that uh, the first pandemic probably also started in China and then it went to the Middle East and then it went to Europe. And the second pandemic also probably st uh, started in China and did the same way. And there's even evidence that it went to Africa. And the third pandemic, uh, well, may have mutated from the second in China and then spread. But wait, there is more. <laughs> it turns out that by the same techniques, they have been able to find it in the Bronze Age. So we're now talking two or three thousand years before Christ. Now the same technique, this is not plague, but this is the same technique. So if you are a stu student of ancient Greece, you know that Sparta and Athens were at each other, frequently fighting each other. And um, uh, I think it was the second Peloponnesian War. Uh, there was a war uh, and uh, an epidemic started in Athens in 430 before Christ, or before the Common Era. It killed a quarter of the population in Athens. Uh, no, it killed two-thirds of the population in Athens and it killed uh, a quarter of the troops. And nobody knew what this was caused by until 2006, where Greek university professors were able to tell that it was a typhoid bacteria. So this is, uh, I think he might have been a physician at the time, uh, Susiklidis, and people, what we know about these diseases are descriptions like this. They're not always modern descriptions, and uh, so uh, we do the best we can. So this is the paper from uh, uh, the Greeks that they showed that the graves from the plague of Athens were caused by typhoid fever, which is a type of salmonella. Now, nowadays, it's actually, it's a toxin produced by the bacteria, but nowadays we have vaccine, so if you're vaccine against the bug, you don't have to worry about the toxoid bacteria. Of course, you replace, and now we have antibiotics, and tetracycline, doxycycline. Nowadays, uh, people don't die of this thing. Everybody heard about the Mexicans and the Aztecs and the Mayas. They died in, until, was this last year or the year before? Until very recently, uh, they were, we were not able to know what caused it. And of course, they had several different epidemics. So what you do is you find a specific grave site and then you analyze that. So at least some of the major uh, epidemic, it turns out uh, there were at least two great uh, Kokolitsi epidemics and at least the second one was caused by this species of salmonella. I mean everybody heard about the smallpox and the blankets and stuff. Well it turns out it wasn't really smallpox but it was salmonella. So it also tells you something about uh, uh, the hygiene and the water supply and fecal oral contamination. Okay. And, and notice there was a smallpox epidemic. They had 22 million in uh, Mexico, went down to 14. And then this Cocolitzi and this one brought it down. 12 million died of this and 2 million of that. So all the way from 22 million, they 
Yes, yes and no, they wind up with one million people in Mexico. And so you were kind of lucky if you were isolated and rural in those days. So now you can do this with other epidemics too. For example, uh, you, can, you can find out, uh, uh, by the way, the earliest evidence of malaria is in the Dominican Republic about 30 million years ago. So. <laughs> and and uh, mosquitoes with malarias in them from humans have been found in amber. So you can extract the DNA from the amber and find the mosquito in there and the plasmodium, okay? And uh, for example, we know that leprosy was in Africa 40,000 years ago and then it spread all over the place. And the other one here highlighted is uh, smallpox, which uh, uh, certainly was around in Egypt around 150. Now we have uh, still epidemics in search of a cause. One of the ones that is most famous is uh, Antonin Plague, which is the one I mentioned about the Marcus Aurelius. And it is because it gave a skin eruption, an exanthem or a skin eruption, it is generally thought to be smallpox or measles. However, we have no positive identification in DNA of either one of them. And as I said, they're small mutations. And whenever you get these mutations, the, the epidemic is not exactly the same as it was before. So it leaves you with a doubt that this could very well be a uh, pest. You know. So we're uh, hoping to find uh, a grave site where this can be conducted and an institute or a place that can be doing this, so stay tuned. But uh, this is one of the things that, uh, there were other plagues, this was not the only one, uh, the uh, late Roman Empire, but this is one of them. But uh, late in the empire, uh, you know, where people were dying uh, like fleas. So people have suspected that it's either smallpox or measles. Uh, thankfully, smallpox may be one of the few diseases we may have actually fully eradicated from the world. If, uh, if uh, files of smallpox are not uh, reintroduced and people don't do uh, uh, terrible things with them. So in conclusion, uh, we can use uh, DNA methods to identify bacterial causes of great epidemics and pandemics they have lasted for a thousand years. So in a way, we have rewritten history. So for example, we now know that one of the reasons why the Muslim troops were so effective against the Christians uh, after the Justinian epidemic is, where, well, they weren't sick. And while the Christians had been decimated, they lost half the population, etc. Of course, if you're a believer, that's Allah's will, of course. So, to my knowledge, we have not been able to show viral diseases with this technique. Now, it's not impossible, but I think viruses have a much shorter uh, DNA. Uh, the primers uh, are not as uh, consistent. The, the viral load may not be as much, and they may not be preserved. The other problem you have is, uh, Viruses do not have that envelope. A lot of the bacteria, they have either waxes on the surface or a lipid or things that when they seal. So if you seal the teeth, then you also, the bacteria also seal within them. So once you break that, uh, the outer layer, then you might be able to get the DNA. So viruses have a problem. They don't have uh, that kind of preservation. So that's it. Thank you. Um, so we have lots of time for questions and comments and thoughts. Um, we have this mic, which is not to amplify, but so that it, when we record this, people can hear the questions as well as the answers. So uh, please use the mic. Uh, 
Since these epidemics have apparently originated in China, I wonder what their reservoir uh, with the animal thing. We know we have prairie dogs. And what do they have over there, Karen, please? He doesn't have to use the Well, number one, the Chinese have a lot of people. The Chinese have had a lot of people for millennia. I mean, it's one of the great civilizations. And most people live in rural areas, and they li live very close to uh, animals. So one of the great reservoirs for influenza is humans and ducks and pigs and genes that move from one to the other. They, I would say they almost jump from species to species. So they have a lot of ducks with people. They have a lot of pigs with people. They have, uh, and so uh, there, there's a lot of uh, DNA movement. I could answer that. Um, actually, there's well, been a recent study. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there's been a recent study that um, looked at the relationship between environmental change in Central Asia which is where a lot of the, the genetic evidence shows that the, the bubonic plague originated, that really imp that links um, environmental like shifts where you know between drying dry seasons and wet seasons, dry years and wet years, and the rise actually of hamster populations and other rodents in general. It's not just rats actually, especially in Central Asia. So um, that's that was probably the main reservoir then in, in Central Asia. I'm looking for the slides of Kyrgyzstan here. One of the, uh, you know, I, I had toy gerbils when I was in college, and gerbils were the reservoir in that epidemic around seven, uh, 338 or 340. So, but when it, when it goes from one uh, species to the other, some species that carry it are not particularly affected. So that's uh, changes, and so and then it, it harbors trans. Uh, uh, it stays there, and then people come through from the Silk Road, and then new genetic predisposition, and they can carry it other places. In fact, for the epidemics that occur with influenza every year, carefully, in China they monitor uh, all of the influenza outbreaks, and and. Uh, then they try to predict which one is potential for hopping over overseas, over to us. And that's how they basically monitor it. So they're monitoring it all the time. CDC is involved as well as the World Health Organization, as well as China. So the vaccine that we are likely to get in a few weeks uh, reflects uh, what they had this spring. And in early January, February, they started predicting which one they should be manufacturing millions of doses for. Yes. I found it really interesting the part about the malaria in the Dominican Republic because I usually think of malaria as being African with falciparum and sickle cell coming from that. I'm curious that you come up with anything about how malaria got from this, this hemisphere to the other hemisphere, or did it originate from two different spots? I don't really have a good answer. Uh, obviously, you know, we had a lot more people in the old world than we had in the new world. And uh, actually, humans may not have been in the Dominican Republic uh, 30 million years ago. No. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, we do have the mosquitoes, and we do have the uh, malaria, and, but other places where they have been in amber, they have been found human blood, but they don't necessarily have, you know. And of course, the hemoglobinopathies that have been uh, mutated to defend against them are primarily from the old world. So I have a question um, that's, I think, rather naive. When I first saw the title of your talk, well, when I saw paleopathology, my mind goes to ancients and bones and sort of not this modern DNA kind of approach. So I'm curious, how, when did, I'm not exactly sure how to formulate a question. When did things change, I mean, when did we transition well, to this sort of new way of thinking? Uh, 
PCR didn't start until 1980. So before 1980, uh, for a lot of sites, the only thing left is bones and teeth. I mean, well, you might have, you know, artifacts, excrements, environmental stuff, but in fact, a lot of paleopathologists was describing what happened in these bones. Is this tuberculosis? Is this syphilis? Is this, you know, so that, uh, that's the way it used to be. But then obviously, in the 90s, we started having this new technique and people have been applying it to solve some ancient problems. Uh, some of, I did not bring some of the failures, okay? Uh, for example, uh, Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus, some of his bones are said to be in the Dominican Republic. They were brought there from Spain because he died in Spain, and some of his bones are said to be in Spain. Furthermore, if your last name is Colon, it's a very famous last name, it's like Washington, you know, you, you, and, and you keep in the family. So, uh, and by the way, they were very rich. He was very rich, and his descendants, some of them were very rich. In fact, one of the admirals of Spain a few years ago was a Colon okay, descendant. So there's modern DNA of his uh, descendants, and there are the bones in Spain, and the question was very simple. Are these bones in the Dominican Republic? They're in this script in the main cathedral. What it says on the inscript, Christopher Columbus, yes or no? Well, one of the problems is uh, uh, the, the bones degraded, the DNA degraded, and we were not able to get a, an answer. Uh, at least with the technology we had back then. So there are a number, uh, but uh, frequently we can, uh, we, we are successful, but sometimes we're not. I can remember reading periodically, so every couple years or something, about the American Southwest, children touching animals, and getting, I'm going to spell it because I, I, I think it's pronounced Hanta, H-A-N-T-A, virus. Is that, uh, is that some of what you've been talking about? Hanta is a virus, and I think whenever you have certain types of uh, dry periods or heavy periods, the, it's present in mice, and then people can get it from it. And occasionally we get an epidemic of it. Um, but apparently has died down lately, and so we haven't heard about Hanta that much. But uh, yes, but Hanta is a, it's a virus and it's a different virus. This is pretty much consistent with uh, Diamond's book about germs and steel. Mm -hmm. You know, you get exposed to an animal, you get your zoonotic diseases from your animal, you die off your population, and then when you move into an area, everybody ahead of you who's not been exposed dies off the disease, and that helps you colonize that area. I mean, death and destruction is part of colonization, basically. Well, I mean, people, I mean, what, it shows that we've, we've had tremendous number of deaths from uh, plague alone and many, many epidemics, so I wouldn't be surprised that if we have a similar presentation four or five years from now, or maybe 10 years from now, we will have five epidemics of, uh, as opposed to three. And by the way, if you, if you put it in perspective, you know, we've had like 50 million people died of AIDS. So if you take half or a third of the world's population of six or seven billion, it would be like two billion or plus or three billion dying of it. So it's, unimaginable uh, the number of people that die. But the good news is that apparently a good number of people survive. The immune system is good for something. Has anyone sort of tried to look at this backwards? What, by that I mean, okay, you're seeing these routes were these routes already known? Um, I mean, here the, here the routes probably were known, they were trade routes. But I was wondering if any have been, any trade routes or human population movements have been deduced from seeing 
here here's this uh, disease, and then there it, it there it is, and didn't probably followed this path because this is where people were sick. I can tell you that modern European density, economic growth and density, reflects uh, urbanization and and density of uh, under the Romans, which is over 2,000 years ago. So places where the Romans had big cities and, and big trade routes, that's where uh, there are very wealthy places in Europe nowadays. So the uh, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, you know, Paris, uh, Milan. So you, know, you would not expect that here we have, what, 2,000 years later, uh, that has changed, that, you know. Of course, we didn't have robots in this part of the world. And in China, I, I, it's probably the same. Well, thanks a lot, Dr. Waltara. I appreciate it and hope you'll come next time, this food and sign-ups. Thank you. Thank you.